Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the new school. My name is Michelle Mater, and I'm Associate Professor of Media Studies and Film here in this wonderful place we call the new school. And I'm actually teaching a class this semester called Pathways to Learning, where we're utilizing a bell hooks text called Teaching to Transgress, which if you're not familiar with, you should be. And I actually remembered to bring it tonight to get Aww. her autograph, woohoo! <laughs> so um, I'm really thrilled to be here this evening to introduce tonight's program with our amazing, incomparable, returning scholar in residence, Bell Hooks. Um, let me just first say, audience members, would you please uh, talk about us using the hashtag Bell Hooks, T and S, capital T and S. Thank you. Um, Bell is here with two other also um, amazing guests, um, and the topic this evening is Mapping Desire, Archaeologies of Change. So I'm going to give a brief background of um, Bell's guests. Uh, Marcy Blackman is an author. Her first novel, Poe Man's Child, received the American Library Association Stonewall Award for Best Fiction and the Firecracker Alternative Book Award for Best New Fiction. Her second novel, Tradition, was noted as one of the Band of Hebs' best books of 2013. I also notice, Marcy, that you have appeared at Branded Saloon. It is in my neighborhood in Brooklyn with my dear friends and colleagues, Rob Fields and Bridgette Davis, who are amazing as well. So welcome, Marcy. And joining in the dialogue is Darnell Moore. Darnell is a senior editor <laughs> at McNews and co-managing co editor at the Feminist Wire. Along with NFL player Wade Davis II, he co-founded You Belong, a social good company focused on the development of diversity initiatives. Darnell's advocacy centers on marginal identity, youth development, and other social issues in the US and abroad. He has led and participated in several critical dialogues, including the 58th session of the UN Commission on the Status of Women. He's just an all around rather prolific author, activist, and a very PC dude. <laughs> <laughs> and what do I say about Bell Hooks? You get applause for Darnell. Bell Hooks is an author, activist, feminist, and our scholar in residence here at the New School. And I don't really recall exactly when we first met Bell. It's been that yes. long ago. <laughs> Do you remember? No. She, okay, good. <laughs> um, I was going to say that's terrible, but I can't remember. You can remember. Um, but I do remember that this was the first time I actually caught myself acting like a groupie. <laughs> and I've met and worked with a lot of pretty famous people like Stevie Wonder and people here and there like that. But I don't think I ever stumbled over myself as much as when I first opened my mouth to speak to Belle. And now, after many years of numerous interactions, I get to call her my sister, my friend, my colleague, and still consider her to be my rock star. I teach here at the New School because it is a place open to dissenting opinions and the avant-garde in scholarship and the arts. And we are proud to host this dialogue. Thank you. Tell people about your film series for the weekend. Oh, see, I'm so bad at this. I have a film series going on starting on Friday. <laughs> it's called Creatively Speaking. Some people may have known about it, been there before. It's our 20th anniversary this year, and we're up at Mist Harlem on 116th and uh, Lenox Avenue. And it's Discovery Weekend, right? Alternative to Columbus, we discover ourselves. So please join us. You can go on. You could go on our website, creativelyspeaking.tv, or also on mistharlem.com and get the um, schedule. But thank you. Hey. Actually, Mapping Desire, Archaeologies of Change was sort of the overall rubric for the residency. And this particular conversation has to do with moving from pain to power. And that's really what we want to discuss about how, how do we, um, as people 
from oppressed and exploited groups, find our way to joy, find our way to emotional well-being, to healing. And today, I was in Judy's class, and they were reading Choosing the Margin as a Space of Radical Openness. And I was like, mm, that bell, she's smart. This is, a, this, is a, this is a really good essay. So I, I'm just going to read a few sentences. I said, as a radical standpoint, perspective, position, the politics of location necessarily calls those of us who would participate in the formation of counter-hegemonic cultural practice to identify the spaces where we begin the process of revision. For many of us, the movement requires pushing against oppressive boundaries set by race, sex, class, domination. In initially, then, it is a defiant political gesture. Moving, we confront the realities of choice and location. Within complex and ever-shifting realms of power relation, do we position ourselves on the side of colonizing mentality or decolonization? I was saying earlier to Darnell that I was a younger person when I first read even Ben Sertima's, they came before Columbus. And I heard him interviewed on the radio and he kept saying, we have not just been colonized in our minds. We've been colonized in our imaginations. So part of what we want to talk about today is how do we, how do we decolonize? Um, how do we use our imaginations in the service of our well-being? Well, Bill, thanks for having me here again. Um, as we were talking about downstairs, one of the things that struck me when we talked about this was the fact that everywhere I go now, I often ask people to imagine what a black loving world looks like. Um, and quite surprisingly, it sounds like an easy question, but people tend to not have answers when I ask them that. Um, they actually get stumped. And it's been many occasions where, regardless of the age group, regardless of if I'm on a college campus or in a community, folk cannot seem to sort of work their imagination in such a way that they can even see a world, dream a world, where black people, brown people, oppressed people are not assailed by either the state or some other means. And it made me think about how survival or being in a mode of survival inhibits or stops or keeps us from having the capacity to even dream which is a violence that is more pronounced, I think, than the type of the gun violence that can deaden us on the street. Imagine how, uh, how, how deadening that is, how, how hard it is then, or how hard it can be for us to live in a world where we can't even see a future, where we ourselves are in it living safely. And in that, I think we need to then decolonize our imagination. But what does that look like? I, I don't even know how you begin to do that work. Well, I think we talked last night some about like, parents, black parents who perceive a child to be gay or to be becoming gay, and a lot of times the oppression that that child suffers um, as people try to beat it out of him or her, talk, you know, and so how do, you, how do you change that? How do you change years of being told something very negative about who you could possibly be? And that, I think, again, has to, has to begin with the imagination. I think it also, I think yes, it begins with the imagination, but I think it also begins with self before we can actually look out at the larger community. And so we've been told so often, whether we've had nurturing, whether we've grown up in nurturing homes or not, we've constantly faced with this, who we are is not good enough. It's not okay. It's not, it needs, we need to strive to be this other thing that's just, that's not us. And so we look at our flaws, which are magical, and our imperfections, which are magical, and we chastise ourselves in our minds and in our imaginations with that. And we, and instead we try to imagine ourselves as something other than perhaps what we are. And I think you know, the first things that we have to begin to do is sit and look in the mirror and and be okay with who we are. Did, did, it, I don't know if anybody saw the Latifah, uh, Bessie Smith movie, and one of my favorite scenes in that film is when she takes off all her clothes after everybody's gone and everybody's left her and then she's in the empty house and she disrobes in front of the mirror and she takes off her, her makeup and she sits there for quite a long beat in cinema time and she just beholds herself. 
and that she doesn't flinch away, she doesn't pick at herself, she doesn't, and it's such a powerful scene to me because I think that's where we have to start, you know? Well, I think that I was thinking a lot about how much a culture of domination always wants us to think of power as outside ourselves. Um, so that we think of power as I'll get this fabulous career or this fabulous partner or this um, fabulous um, amount of money. And, but power is always conceived as power over something and not as what is my power within. And so I, I feel that part of our colonization as brown people, black people, Asian people is we often internalize that sense of powerlessness because we feel like, well, what's my power in relationship to the world? I don't have any, you know? And so I, I, I think that we often embrace death. You know, my brother who's 60 some years old, a recovering addict for 25 years, uh, just really beats himself up for not having money. And I say to him, Ken, look at the blessing of your life. How many working class black men can come back from addiction, um, can, can be born again in recovery. But on his scale of evaluation, that doesn't mean anything. And so part of what I learned early on is we have to change the scale of evaluation. Because if we continue to judge ourselves by the standards set within that imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, then we never move. Because even if we move, but we still have what I call the voice of judgment. My theory is that the dominating culture depends on the voice of judgment. You know, that even when you're succeeding, you're not good enough. Even when, you know, I didn't think I was a writer, even after I had books published. Because, you know, for me, you know, what, what did I think a writer would be? What would be the magic moment that I could say, I'm a writer? And that whole thing had to do with my needing some type of validation outside myself to give me power um, and not to be able to think of, you know, power that I can give myself, that we can self-generate. Um, and I worry, and I talked a little bit, and we're not going to talk about Black Lives Matter tonight, but I was saying Sometimes I worry because so many of our energies of protest and resistance are outer directed. You know, last night I asked the audience, what if we took away all the police brutality in our society against black males? Would black males still be, would black males be self-actualized? Is it really police brutality that is keeping black males from, you know, I mean, I think about, I mentioned my brother last night, how my father used to say to him, glory, to me, glory, your brother ain't worth a nickel. And he loved putting my brother down. I mean, it's amazing that my brother could come out of addiction. You know, when I hear people like putting little black children and boys, especially you stupid, you dumb, uh, down, you think, how, how will that person empower themselves from that? How, do, how are we healing from that? I was over here like I was in church. Like, <laughs> I don't even need to talk, just keep talking. I, oh my gosh, I was, I was downstairs and I, I was saying to Belle, like for all the, the good that I experienced, it, I feel so guilty sometimes when I, make, when I have wins. Mm -hmm. Like, damn, I mean. As a black gay man? As a, as a body in this world, period. And I, it has okay. something to do with, my, with me being black and, and, me, being, and me being gay. Um, me always on the other side of oppressions that sort of have a way of beating um, this, this notion of self-actualization, our well-being out of us, so that I never feel good enough often. I feel like I always have to go the extra mile to prove something, um, to myself even. But I don't know, I mean, I think you're, you're hitting on something and it's making me think, well, what are the rules of our engagement? Like, who, who are our real enemies? Isn't internal abolition as much all right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what does internal abolition look like? I mean, one actually needs to know that they're bound by a thing in order to get free from it. Um, and that work requires us being in community with people, right? So like, I don't know if, I won't know that I need to be free unless I am actually aware of all those things that I need to be free from. And I think that that work is really hard. Self, self, self 
like the, the awareness of where one is situated in the world and how those oppressors are working out on you has to happen before one is actually self-actualized or, or freed. And I think that's important and hard work, though. Yeah. When I, when I was small, my, my, and, and all through my life, um, my parents always told me, you know, whatever I tried to do, they would say, you can do anything you want. Often it was followed with, you just have to do it better than white people, but, <laughs> but, 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 but it was never, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't. You can do whatever you want. You can do anything you want. You know, and I also used to witness my mother on what I think is like are some of the, are some really small things. But I think the small things, as we stack them up, create the big thing, right? They create the, the big picture. And whenever she would do something, whether it was, you know, baking a baking a cake, or whether it was um, doing the taxes for my 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 parents for their for their store, she she would. When she did something well, she would she would say things like, delicious, Harriet. Or she would say, well done, Harriet. Like, she would praise herself. And all I, right. All and right. I got to witness that, you know? And, I, and, 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 and even, even in witnessing that, though, I still fall in the same, you know, I, like, I do these things. And, like, I've done a lot of things in my life. They're kind of all over the place. But I, like, I've ridden my bicycle across the country. I've written books. I've jumped out of airplanes. I've done all kinds of things, you know, because I envisioned what I wanted to do. And I just kind of go out and I do it. And, but I still have these moments when I call my mom up and I'm like, I can't write for shit. I'm throwing my computer out of the window. I'm doing that, and she won't entertain it. You know, she just, she just, and we get, we get our arguments are. I can't listen to that. I can't hear that. I, I can't hear that from you because you, you are too capable. You are too, and it's just constantly, constantly reinforced. And I wonder what happens if we take that reinforcement and we do that with others, or I do that with Darnell, or I do that with Belle, or I do that with you know any of you sitting in the audience. We do that with each other as as well as ourselves. What what does the world begin to look like if we begin to start those things? Well, I I was telling people I had a birthday recently, and when I had my birthday, I had people come over and bring a poem as a gift. And um, this year, somebody brought a kind of, I called it a ditty more than a poem, but it was like, um, it starts off, it says, when God says yes. I asked God, was it OK to be melodramatic? And she said, yes. <laughs> and you go down this poem, and it really struck me about how much of our time in our life we say no to the self, yeah. that that is part of the role of the voice of judgment. Um, that it is saying no. And I was telling Darnell about how initially it was very difficult for me to think about a Bell Hooks Institute, um, which is something I'm beginning in Berea. I have been particularly aware, especially through Marlin and Essex even more, of how if we don't take care of, you know, Essex used to always say when he was leaving, take care of your blessings. But Essex did not take care of his archives. And then you get the homophobic, hateful families that come in. And you know, I always had this image. My mother's dead now. But I used to have this image that my mother and my sister, oldest sister, would come to my house. And they would open drawers where I had recent writing. And they were like, nobody needs to read this shit. <laughs> and they would, they would uh, be busy throwing it in the fireplace and burning it. But you know, that happens to black people and black writers all the time. I've always loved the story that's told of Georgia Douglas Johnson, that this white man who's doing literary work on her work uh, goes somehow to where, near where she lives. And somebody says, oh, her house is up for sale. Uh, you could go see it. He goes to see it and finds in the basement, as the story is told, all of her work, her papers, slated to go to the trash. And he asked the realtor, oh, do you mind if I have those papers? And she says, well, you know, they don't belong to me. You would have to contact the family. Then you get these families, you know, like Langston Hughes's family that would not allow uh, Isaac Julian to say anything about Langston being gay or to even use Langston's words. So that, you know, and what do we know? What do we know as poor and working class black people about how important, because to, to believe you have a legacy worth preserving is to have that yes about yourself. So when I started feeling like, wow, um, I should do something, because my sister Teresa died unexpectedly a year and a half or so ago, and I thought, 
she seemed really well, and then all of a sudden, you know, she'd fallen and she, she was dead in the space of weeks. And it made me think about, well, what, Bell Hooks, what are you doing about your work? And I had somebody do, you know, how I am, um, failure somewhat at computers, do a search for me, like, are there black women that have centers? And they could only find one, which was the Shirley Chisholm Center here in Brooklyn. And I thought, okay, what should I do? What would I want, you know? Because I think there again, we go back to the imagination. What would I want for my papers? What would I want for my artifacts? And number one, I want is for people like me to be able to access, access those things without showing ID, with, without having to go through metal detectors or what have you. So I thought, well, you know, Belle, why don't you just create an institute? And I went to black females who had centers and things, and people were 100% negative. You don't know what you're doing. You know, I went to a prominent black man, and he just said to me, you stupid. This is the stupidest thing I've heard. I mean, so, I mean, what I want us to think about is how if you don't have the yes, yes. you will be crushed by other people. Yes. Even people you, these are people I admired and respect that I thought would cheer me on. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the good thing is that I, ha I have a cheerleader inside me now, mm -hmm. you know, that can say yes. Yes, yes Bell Hooks, try it. Mm -hmm. If you, all that can happen is it cannot work. And that I think is what I, I feel like if we could instill that in little brown, black, and, and yellow, and whatever children, the yes, the yes to yourself. Um, I had a white woman friend who parented, and she was like really big on just saying yes to her children, just being affirming. And I thought, wow, what would that be like? Because our childhood was riddled with no's and punishments, and then the pleading against the no. But Marcy, I'm really um, interested in the idea that you got the yes, but then what made you become a person who couldn't give the yes fully to yourself? Because I got the yes in, at home. I got the yes in the, my womb circle, and then when I went out in the world, there were, I, I, the world said, what do you mean, yes, you know? Didn't anybody tell you no, you know? And so, so, the, so the words, so, the, so even though I was like, yes, 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 you know, I was the little salmon, you know, f swimming upstream, and, 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 and everybody was swimming downstream, and I literally was. When I rode my bike across the country, I rode from San Francisco to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and I forgot I first rode up from San Francisco to Oregon to Portland, and I, f I, f I, I didn't think I was a city kid. I didn't, you know, this was a this was a me thinking I can do this, and I didn't think to check the wind direction, right? <laughs> so I'm the only one <laughs> for 800 miles, the only one riding north, and I'm passing cyclist after cyclist going the other direction, and to a person. You're going the wrong way, they yelled at me. You're going the wrong way. And that's kind of the story of my life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I think you have to be willing to, you know, even with all the no's back and coming back, I think every once in a while it seeps in. You have to, it's like you have to practice due diligence, you know? And, and you, have to, you have to be good to yourself. You have to treat yourself with kindness and treat yourself and, and with acceptance and, you know, I, I went through a, a recent breakup and um, decided that I, and, and my response to it was, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna date myself for a while. I'm gonna <laughs> take myself out to dinner, I'm gonna take myself to the movies, and, and I realized I've been treating people really well. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, and then I was like, why don't I treat myself like this? <laughs> so I think it's a constant, I think it's a, I think it's a constant battle to be able to stay in the yes. Like, I, you and know? I think that we might even argue that part of the, what characterized the dysfunctional family, and I'm not one of those people that believe all families are dysfunctional, is that the dysfunctional family is based on domination and the no. Um, so, you know, whatever it is you want to be, there's a no. And so I think that the question begins, how do we begin as a people, as African-American people, as other people of color, to undo the no? My, my thing that I always heard is, nigger girl, who do you think you are? 
I heard that from so many different sources. And, I, and in a way, when people said about the Institute, um, you know, why, who do you think you are? They were still saying, nigger girl, who do you think you are? The joy is that I know who I am. Yeah. But I know who I am through struggle. And so that I want to talk, I think we have to be open about the, the place of struggle to be and find and know yourself. And for me, a lot of that comes to, to, from therapy. You know, like when you've been raised in the total fucked up context, um, <laughs> one of the things is that you don't see clearly. I would tell my therapist, white woman, trailer trash white woman uh, as a background, very overweight, um, not the kind of model um, that would have been my fantasy therapist. And she, but she, one of the things that she taught me very deeply is one, don't look at what people say, look at what they do. And two, she told me, why can't you ask yourself what's wrong with this picture? And I talked the other night about, you know, calling her, you know, when the, I've left the boyfriend, but I want him to get back with me, and he's treating me bad, and I would call her. She was like, call me if you're feeling like you need someone. And I was like, well, I want to go over to his house. I want to see him. And she would be like, that's fine. But if you think you're going to find some love there, don't waste your time. Because there hasn't been any love there, and you're not going to make it there. And it's like moments like that when she says, you know, to, to try to break yourself into reality. Because I think that one of the things that holds a, so many of us back is fantasy. That we, we, we are raised in the fantasy. So even when you're in something where you're being treated like total shit, a job or, or someone saying something, we, we don't hear it. I mean, when I would tell her things that people had said and done, she would, she would, sometimes she would cry and say, I just can't believe that happened to you. And I'd be like, what's your problem? <laughs> you know, because I had been taught that the tough thing was to endure those things, to, um, I mean, to, to um, get past them, not to, not to walk, cry, not to whine. Um, and so, I think back to Marcy's comment, one of the things I think as black people particularly we haven't said yes to is our grief. Um, our collective grief as black leaders who touched our lives were taken from us uh, very young. Our grief about the fact that we don't have that many black leaders right now that we feel like, yes, I would follow that person. You know, and that there's, there's a sorrow about that. There is a sense that we've lost our way and we don't know how to find it. Because we're still stuck in that old model of one leader, rather than the many possibilities around us uh, of leadership, of guidance. And you know, a lot of times, I'm one of these people. I am, I have to admit, total book slut, uh, <laughs> constant reader of self-help books. Um, and I think, I mean, you, you you don't know how much we as people of color think really crazy things. Like I think to myself frequently, who's buying all of these self-help books like <laughs> Brene Brown and um, all of these things? And I think, well, white people are teaching themselves how to let go the voice of judgment, how to resist the internal dominator. But what are we doing? You know. Uh, I read a, a young woman was writing a paper for me, and she was saying, we're so enamored of the oppressor's face that we can't turn away, that we can't say no to images. I mean, I, the hostility that people directed towards me when I said, no, I didn't like 12 Years a Slave, that if I didn't see another movie where a black woman was being beaten and raped and abused as long as I lived, I would be fine. Because what is that image doing? I think when we watch certain images over and over again, what the message they give us is there's no way out. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, you can't get out. Because you can't get out as long as you're saying no. And so, I mean, even in thinking about who could be on this panel, I had to really think about who are the people that say yes to themselves. You know, I had been with Mar Marcy as a friend through the, the profound grief. Because saying yes doesn't mean you get away from pain. That she felt a lot of grief over her relationship ending. 
But, you know, it's again, what do you do with that grief? How do you use it? Um, how do you turn it into uh, Marcy growing as a self in the world so that she's not stuck? Because a lot of us are stuck. We're stuck in the abuse of childhood. We're stuck in the abuse of adulthood. We're stuck in the teacher telling us we dumb and stupid. And those tapes just play over and over. So we can say that part of the movement from pain to power, power as agency over our lives, is getting rid of those tapes. And it sounds simple, but it's an ongoing process. Darnell, you were talking about that earlier, how the process just goes on. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here like, damn. <laughs> um, you know, often I have to remind myself of who I was at 14, and I um, recall, like in my in my world, at that time there was a lot of a lot of a lot of hell happening in my home, right? Like, so there was a lot of violence that I was witnessing in my home, um, on the streets. So when I would have to go to school, um, I would have to be confronted with violence then too, right? So after not sleeping at night because your mom is being beat up by your father and you walk on the street, you're being called punks and sissy and faggots and um, beat up by the kids in your neighborhood. Um, for some reason, when I look back at pictures, I never thought that 14 year old me um, smiled until I started looking back at pictures. I actually forgot that I smiled at that age. And in fact, when I looked at the pictures, I kept thinking, how could you find your smile in the midst of all that hell? But it wasn't until recently when I was writing that I remembered that it was also at that same age when a white teacher told me, one, that I was a bad writer. She actually said in front of my class, you can't write. That's what she said. Um, but during that same, that same year, that same year after I was literally almost set on fire, when my father is beating my mom, I went to school and I knocked on Miss Yaldell's door, my guidance counselor, and I said to her, I, I need to be in an academically talented classes. At 14. So where did that come from? I don't know. Well, I'm sitting here thinking about it as you're talking, and I'm like, what was it in me or in the environment or in the spirit that propels someone who's literally feeling like they're in hell to go into this guidance counselor's office and demand, because my grades were fine, to put me in AT? And then I found a private school in the Yellow Pages. We didn't have Google then. <laughs> and I called this school up, and I faked my mom's voice. I act like I was her. <laughs> And she's probably watching me now. You she know this story. Now. I faked her. I, fa I had a high voice, and I act as if I was my mother. And I, ex I asked them to send an, uh, an application to the house. I filled this application out. I wrote my mom's essay and got into this private school. <laughs> now, all of that sort of struggle and that power, that self-empowerment, occurred in the midst of straight-up hell, which tells me like, that there is the potential within our, the living in and how we live through our traumas to locate that deep sense of power within ourselves, to pull ourselves up out of it. I think what was propelling me was this idea that there has to be something better than this shit that I'm in right now. There has to be something better. My, I had to imagine and see a thing that was different than a home where mom was getting beat, where she did not deserve to be beat, where she would, you know, a home where we were fighting to find, find out what to eat. And I, I figured, well, I need to dream that and I need to do what I can to make it happen. Um, so part of it had to do with my imagination that, in, that inspired the action, like the real-time action on the ground. Which is, of course, if we read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning about the Nazi Holocaust, and I mean, he talks so deeply about the role of the imagination. What keeps you going? What, what does the imagination make possible? And so when we think about fantasy, there's that line between fantasy and the imagination. Because if we get addicted to fantasy, then we trance and we never, we, we never come back to reality. I always say to people, I like the definition of insanity that says it's when you're not in reality. And my people, my people as Zora Neale Hurston would say, a lot of us are not in reality. We are fantasizing a life, or which is different from imagining. Um, a life because whenever you concretely imagine in a real way, you also do have to imagine what are the concrete steps that are going to get me there. Uh, and that, that is, you know, the, you know that little, uh, I think they have it at the Buddhist Museum, there's a, a statement that says you don't know how um, strong you are until you know how strong love makes you. But you can't, 
you can't get to the love until you start with that self. Um, it's like you got like a piece of fruit where you got to cut off the rotten parts. Um, you can't get to the well-being uh, without doing that. And I, I was thinking when I read, you know, a lot of Brene's work where she's talking about vulnerability and how healing comes to through making yourself vulnerable. But then I was thinking about how as black people, people of color, <laughs> we're told again and again not to be vulnerable especially black masculinity, heteronormative masculinity. Vulnerability is seen as, oh no, that will get you killed. I mean, when I was a kid, I had a lot of grief and I cried a lot. And my whole family would shame me and I was called Miss White Girl. There was a white woman actress, Jean Autry, who played the role of little rich girl and she cried all the time. And you know, you can imagine, like I just thought, what is wrong with me? I just cry all the time. And I just felt an enormous sense of sadness about my life, about the life around me. You know, and it took me years to stop that crying. I had nighttime terrors. Um, but it's like, it's work. You got to work it. You gotta work towards your happiness and you gotta choose. And think about how do we, as people who've been told we don't have choice, recognize that you do have choice? Sometimes I think it's a, a, a thing of like, I mean, you know, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, you know? And I think that. I don't know about that, Marcy. <laughs> and I think, as, as Darnell was saying, that, that it, you know, in the midst of all this hell, you know, there's a point, I think, where you come to, well, if this is it, well, then I might as well envision and imagine and do the things that I want to do because this is it, you know? And, and I, I, I had an experience that wasn't born out of like being in the midst of hell, but I was lost. I was lost on a bicycle in the mountains in Italy, and I was lost. I really was lost, and I was getting dark, and I didn't know how to get back home, and all I could do was look out and see other mountain ranges across, and I thought, you know what? I could die right now, right now, and the world would continue, and nobody would know that I no longer was on the planet. Maybe after a couple of weeks of my family not hearing from me, they might, they might, you know, and this was a trip where, you know, I mean, I think I had like $200 in my pocket and I saved a bunch of money for a plane ticket and said, I'm going, I'm gonna go do this, you know? I tend to do things like that. I don't necessarily recommend that. But, um, <laughs> but in any case, that moment was really freeing for me. I think that was a big turning point. It was at that point in my life when I decided, I'm, I, I am a writer, I'm, I'm gonna do this because it doesn't, it, my, m as much as we, t as much as all this, this, this pain is forced upon us and this no is put upon us and this is, is where it doesn't, it's really about my life right now, right here. And it doesn't, in the scheme of things, in this weird way, it kind of doesn't matter. It's like it was so freeing. So if, 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 if I can just disappear and nobody's gonna notice, then I can go and do whatever I wanna do and nobody's gonna, and it doesn't matter, you know? Well, I was thinking about, um, again, vulnerability, Marcy, because to me, I, I don't know how to ride a bike. <laughs> so I never learned, and I always feel incredibly intimidated with Marcy, because, uh, you know, <laughs> she does her bicycle tours uh, with people of New York City. Uh, she takes her bike when she goes places. But one of the things that struck me both about the other conversations we've had is the role of courage. Um, because I do think that in a sense, Marcy's back riding, bike riding has been a kind of spiritual practice of courage, of her each step of the way growing stronger, growing more courageous. Um, and I think that that's really vital to moving from pain to power, the role of courage, the step that you take um, and I think it's interesting, Darnell, that we don't, I mean, for some of us, the reason we believe in God or higher power is because you've taken that step. Like when you, you know, who knows what made you wake up and say, Darnell, you know, you need to look for a better school. Um, I mean, when people first asked me to write children's books for black children, I was like, no way. You know, I'm not happy. 
I'm an intellectual. <laughs> how, how am I going to write something for children? But I do, um, and I, I've been coming out more, I do have a very intense spiritual practice in my life. So I, I appeal to the divine, like, if this is something I'm meant to do, then you're going to have to give it to me, because I don't see it. <laughs> I don't see where it's going to come from. And I tell people, you know, I'm lying in bed. It's like almost midnight. And all of a sudden, I have in my head that first line from Happy to Me, Nappy. Girl pie hair smells clean and sweet. It's soft like cotton, a halo, a crown, a covering for heads that are round. And I tell people that part of, part of why I'm a believer in higher powers, where did that come from? Why did it, you know, all I know is that I had put it out there in the universe. And so I want us to talk about manifesting as a key to claiming one's power because I do think that those of us who come from poor backgrounds, the idea of manifesting, because one of the things, when you're in the, in the environment of intimate terrorism, you're trying to manifest like crazy, like, <laughs> oh, if dad would just stop yelling, if mom would just stop hitting, all of the things, and, and it ain't happening. You know, you're, you're, you're visualizing, like, I always laugh with the, you know, when people say you can visualize wealth, and I was like, honey, if all it would took was visualization, <laughs> you know, so that, and yet at the same time, again, we have to try to sow that seed that helps us to manifest. Um, and I think that that is such a key to how we move from pain to power. And it's really been hard for me to think about, because I think there's the hokey, like, oh, just imagine, just visualize. And it, it doesn't always work that that, well, it doesn't always work. But manifesting in the sense of recognizing an energy that's inside you and thinking that you can grow the seed of that energy. And I just um, finished reading uh, the biography of Oral Roberts. Um, and one of the things, if you know the ministry of the evangelical person, Oral Roberts, was that he, he developed that whole thing called the seed. Uh, like, what is the seed that you plant? Um, and, you know, and preached lots of sermons about, well, you know, if you're plant, uh, planting a peach, you're not going to grow an apple. That you've got to be clear about what is the seed that I'm planting. And that you start with the, you start with the zero. I mean, you started with the minus. The teacher done told you a bunch. You can't <laughs> write. But some kind of way you worked. You know, maybe even a person telling you you can't write makes you aware that you want to write. Yeah. I don't want to believe what that person is saying. So that's my seed that I'm, I'm planning that I'm still going to be a writer, uh, even though these folks are saying I can't. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it, I, I was thinking, I was, a, I was a church boy at 14, actually. So it's, as you're talking, I actually would be, this is so, so corny, but I would go to the restroom and pray and read the Bible um, at 14. And Strange. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I was praying for stuff like, God, stop my dad from hitting my mom. Yeah. I remember yeah. praying like, you know, I admitted this in writing once. Like, I, I prayed for God to get him out of my life. And I said, if you need to kill him do whatever you need to do. Like, that's how real it was. And I believed it. At the same time, I was also praying for good grades. <laughs> um, and got all A's on my report card and got all these. So I, I, I do want to, I want to talk about the metaphysics and this, and this sort of realm of spirit as a legitimate area that we should take seriously. Exactly. Um, that we don't. And, and I, I think so many of us, regardless of what that may look like, um, I know, for instance, that a lot of my strength has come from somewhere outside of self, if that's my ancestors, if that's my grandfather, who I feel like, look, if, if that's the energy that's available, what we haven't talked about is collectives and community. So like I'm looking around a room at the people who I know, like keep me alive. You know, the, their, their energy in my, in my in, you know, my, my neighbors, my best friend who lives four houses down, like the, the, the energy that's present in our collective relationship I don't. I want to talk about self in relation to community, not a self in in relate like just out here in a vacuum. I am here because of my people. But if you think about it, I mean that was the core of Alice Miller's no notion that 
the abused child can survive if they have a witness. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that witness becomes the person that offers you a different sense of yourself. Yeah. Um, and most of us who come out of abuse into our recovery and our salvation have had those people who have witnessed on our behalf. Yeah. Um, and those people usually come in our community um, that we live within. So that I think that that is a very crucial mm -hmm. aspect of moving from pain to power, that you have the healthy people around you. Because let's face it, I always say, my Angelou used to say, there's, that you're never lonely in Babylon. So you know, whenever you want some toxic stuff, it's available. <laughs> you, can, you can go out and get it. Uh, you can have friends and people who will lead you astray in a minute. Um, and I mean, one thing Darnell and I were talking about is, you know, we can decide that we want to be loved, that we want to be in relationships of love, but that doesn't mean that we're going to find the people to be with. Talk about it, cuz. And so, um, I know I was teasing him earlier, I was like, I don't mind having a gay man as a partner, you know, because before I die in this world, I want to have that sense of what it is to love and be loved. Because many of us coming out of abusive settings, we've not had that. We, we don't know what that looks like. And that's the other thing. Sometimes you have to find out what something looks like. Um, and then you have to grieve that you don't have it. And you may be getting old and you don't have it. <laughs> so you may have to figure out um, what is enough within that. Um, it, I know that in my own longing for partnership and love, it has he led me to value friends more. Mm -hmm. Because I recognize in communion, the, the female search for love, I talked about what does it mean to dance in a circle of love? Where you, when one person moves out of the circle, you still got people to dance with. Mm -hmm. But you've got to cultivate, that's again, the seed that you've got to cultivate. And what does it mean to value a friend as you would value a partner. Yeah. And that is, again, I think, totally counter-hegemonic mm -hmm. because everything in our culture is constantly telling us that the partner is everything. Yeah. Finding the partner. And so not finding love, mm. but finding the partner. And that, especially black women, that's why we get hooked up with so many people who treat us cruelly, abusively, because we're trying to find the partner. Uh, we're trying to validate that I'm worth something because I have found somebody and not that I um, am hoping to love. And then having to grieve that that love doesn't come in the directions that you might think. A lot of the love in my life, for example, comes from white people. I would like to have some love uh, concretely from black people in my life. I love you, Bill. But I learned, oh. thank you, Marcy. <laughs> but, but I learned, though, that am I going to turn myself away from love because it's not coming in the color um, that I, or the form that I think it should come? That's the saboteur. That's the sab sabotage that keeps us in pain. Rather than saying, you know, I'm going to have to go where the love is. <laughs> and where the love is is the hope of community. That's why I tell people, they get annoyed. I said, I take my community where I find it. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you find... Um, that helping hand, that person that you understands you, like Barbara Smith's sister says, I was not meant to be alone and without you who understand. And sometimes that person that understands is not in the embodied form that you want them to be in. And that is a challenge, I think, for black people like myself who are obsessed with style and beauty, and we want things to come in a certain kind of package. Um, and what, what <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I had said on my tombstone it was going to say, I die for style. <laughs> but in the search for true love, you begin to let that go. Because you realize that, that, that you can't eat that, that you can't, that I, I keep um, pushing uh, David Wolverstone's book, uh, Unhooked about addictions, because it's so much about feeding the void within ourselves. That Where does that void come from? I was thinking that one of the places of power for me, strong place for power, is not looking at television. 
I don't see how any black and brown person can look at television and, and come away whole. Because it's like, even without you knowing it, there's something going on there that's chipping away at your value, that's repeatedly telling you that you value less. So I think about those children that we're sitting in front of the, the TV all day long, and then we, we think, why aren't they healthy? Why don't they want to learn? Blah, 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 blah. Well, it's interesting when, when we go back, take it back to imagination, that for just, for me, watching television is like watching somebody else exercise their imagination, you know? And I'm not, whereas reading a book, I'm exercising my imagination because I'm interacting with it, you know? So when I'm watching this box, and I've watched my share of television, I'm not, you know, I'm just, in, when I'm watching this box though, I, I, sometimes I catch myself and I'm like, I'm sitting here watching what somebody, somebody else imagining what they wanted and seeing it through and doing it. Why am I sitting here watching this? Why, am I, why aren't I out here imagining and seeing through what I, what I need to see through? But I also was thinking a, a lot in my life about how the years that I've stopped watching TV, it's like I can't talk to a lot of people because that's how they talk. Cross class, cross race. They talk through some show that they're, they're seeing, um, some comment about a show. And I was thinking about, I mean, when I started the dream of conversations, I said, you know, I, I'm just not seeing people learning through lectures. Um, people come to lectures and they don't remember a lot of what has taken place. I really truly believe that the revolutionary form of learning is conversation, that we remember what people tell us. We already know marketing learned long ago that people will buy a book rather than through an ad through Stephanie telling me, Belle, you've got to read this book, or me telling her, and that we pass that on so that the conversation to me is a source of power and to be able to talk with um, people about our past or about our traumas, because I find my family still very hostile. My sister will tell me, well, you know, if, if you just shut up talking about it, maybe you could get over. And I'm like, you know, it's because I can talk about it um, that I can find my way to, to leave it behind, um, to let it go. But if you can't ever speak about it and you just want to cover it up, which we're being always asked to cover up our emotional feeling to where, and I think this is especially true of black males, where you're just emotionally numb. And, um, you know, um, the feeling black men in my life have been gay men. And gay men, not because they're gay, but individual gay men like Marlon, like Essex, who struggled for critical self-awareness, who were willing to interrogate themselves to, to arrive at a different place. Gay men who thought, you know, I see the patriarchy in other gay men, and I am working to throw that off. And Darnell is one of the, the, our leaders as a black gay man who is saying, I do not embrace patriarchy as a sign of my gayness. Because there are just as many gay men who act like male domination and maleness is all that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it takes, again, courage to stand up and say, you know, I don't want to do that. For, for Darnell to be one of the men behind Feminist Wire, is there any other man? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got, we got some. <laughs> it don't work. I wanted to just say, though, that um, I recently, to be quite honest, I looked at um, uh, this, it's a, 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 a colleague, he has a, on, on his Facebook page, he and his partner, he's white and gay, and I was, I was looking at their pictures and all of them were coupled. And they looked really, really happy. Like in costumes on like holidays and they're like at the beach and I'm just like, where, where they do that at? Like where, you know, where? <laughs> I, I really had this moment like what? And I had, I, it was such a deep moment for me and, it, and I started thinking, well damn, um, black men attempting to do the radical act of loving black men, like Joseph Beam said, is a, such a, a, a precarious action, or, or it's, it's, it, it takes work, right? Because you're attempting to love a reflection of yourself, a reflection you've been taught to hate. Um, 
you've been you've been violated by strict gender roles, by heteronormativity. You've been taught to hate all, right. all of these aspects of yourself. And then you're attempting to love a reflection of yourself when you don't even love yourself. So we get into these, I think, like as black, queer, bi, you know, bi, whatever, as men, like particularly like this, this thing where you're attempting to love in the midst of a violent form of like responses to all the things that are, that are beating you down. That's very different than I think white men coming together trying to love each other without loving through racism and loving through the patriarchy and loving through the, the, the violence that misogyny works itself out on us. All right. Um, and I, I want to say like that, that it's hard then. It becomes really hard because I, I think I've been successful. And I told you this downstairs. I feel like I, have, I can count successes in so many areas. And in my interpersonal relationships, particularly with other black men, it feels hard as shit. <laughs> Now, I'm not blaming that on the crabs. I want to name the barrel as the system that turns otherwise loving beings into fighting beings, right? So I think that work though requires like some deep, deep, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, and I don't, I'm not talking as someone who is himself freed from the pull of all these things I'm talking about. I myself have to, to think about my position in patriarchy. Um, the way I can be sexist and misogynist, the way that, that my skewed understandings of gender impacts who I date, who I choose to have sex with, who I choose to allow into my space. That shit still limits me, even well, as I'm trying to ther you know, work myself out of it. One, for me, I mean, I still think that the recovery movement, uh, <laughs> Bill Wilson, everything, is still one of the great mov movements in our society. It's one of the few places where people that are poor can have a therapeutic practice without paying for it. I'm talking about AA, NA. It's one of the places where, where many of us coming from impoverished backgrounds have been able to turn to heal. But um, the, the, the thing that I take from the idea that um, you're always um, vulnerable to addiction is that we're always vulnerable. I mean, that's why I don't let myself watch certain things or look at certain things, because it's so deeply ingrained in us, the white supremacist seeds, um, that we're not beautiful, that we're not this, that if you, you know, just, I love fashion magazines, but I begin to notice that the more I looked at the white fashion magazines, the more I felt not good somewhere inside myself, and that I had to, I was teasing a friend, I was like at church, we used to sing this Jesus be a fence all around me every day. <laughs> so actually I was talking uh, with my sister friend Laverne Cox and we were talking about, just think about her, that she has been deeply affected with, by Belk's work, that she is critically aware of the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy at the same time that she's working within that. How can she protect uh, herself? How can she make the compromises that don't destroy her integrity? And you would think black people, people of color, that we would have all kind of groups where we're talking about this shit. <laughs> where, 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 where we're telling each other, well, this is what you have to do uh, when you go to, and pl to play that part, but you don't feel like that's, that something is being asked of you that you can righteously do. Think about how, how many areas of our life that we have to, um, you know, confront as an individual, but we don't confront it in the collectivity. It's, along with conversation, I'm very interested in collaboration. I've been in this women's group for five years, and one of the things that we try to do in the group is resolve problems collaboratively and collectively rather than the liberal individual model that says, you've got to solve this yourself. You know, like even if the problem is, like the one woman that just found out her husband is cheating and she would like him to leave but she doesn't have the money, um, then where we can put out in the world, is there a place um, that somebody has? Um, or, you know, that person might not feel like they can say, I need a free place. Um, and just that sense, again, of how we engage acts of self-care and emotional well-being. And it's very, very difficult, because I find sometimes that when you bring up these things with other black people, people feel very threatened. It's like you're bringing out of the closet something that people want 
you to keep in the closet, even to talk about. I mean, Marlon and I used to argue all the time because he would say, you know, black men loving black men. And I was like, oh, Marlon, black men dealing with their childhoods first <laughs> because you cannot get to the love if you can't deal with where the childhood wound is. Because I've been thinking so much cross race about father abandonment and how many black men, white men, I was reading uh, Wayne Dyer's memoir, I can see clearly now, and he talks about how you know, his father just walks out when the, he never saw his father, um, and how that was the, the imprint that governed his whole life. His whole life, he searched um, for that missing father. And I, I think that so many black men engage that longing, that yearning. Because like my brother, even though dad was there, my brother began to feel that dad couldn't possibly be his dad. Because his real dad wouldn't be putting him down all the time. His real dad would want to do things with him. And, and that's how Wade Dyer felt, because the stepfather was an a, a insane alcoholic man. And so it was, it, it was fueling that longing for the person who can, again, the interface, where healing does not take place in isolation. We cannot move from pain to power in isolation. Because let's remember that Darnell tells us he went to the guidance counselor. You know, he didn't just by himself try to enact it. He had to reach out and have somebody else meet him in the ground where he was seeking transformation. We're going to open up for questions. Your name, be loud, be short. Um, your name? Yes, Negro Land. Middle class, oh damn, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> So she was saying that because the expectancy for middle class black women had been so high, the, the, the bar, that what she appreciated about feminism is that it allowed her as a black woman to admit that she was depressed, that she was weak, and that she was suicidal. But what also happened was she would try to, she would practice suicide exercises, but she would stick her head in the oven to make sure that if she was going to kill herself, that she was going to do it better. And she had did this so much, she ended up not killing herself. And it was like this irony of like showing you how these expectations on the black body places it in a place where it's like, where we're not gonna stoop that low, but then it also like shows that if a black woman killed herself, that we would be more worried about how she looked when she died as opposed to her dying. And Absolutely, so, so there's a question there. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So the question, <laughs> so, so, so the, 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 the question I wanna ask you is, is do you think then that there is something about getting the nose and the high expectations that gives our bodies grace as black people. The fact that the way in which we navigate our bodies, and because one of the things that protected her from killing herself was the expectation that she was better than killing herself. So I wanted to know, like, how do you think that the nose do inform us in a way that makes us? You know, I think that any adversity can lead you to growth uh, if you embrace that inverse adversity as there's something here, a seed here of, of learning, of possibility, so that that's how you recycle that insanity into something else. Um, another question, your name? Uh, Amanda, uh, so parallel to uh, deconstructing patriarchy for your gender roles, um, obviously there's decolonization for your understanding your racial identity, but what I've come to discover through my own decolonization is that it also affects my own gender identity. So how do you think um, decolonizing for understanding your ethnicity has affected your own personal gender identity? Well, I think though that when we decolonize, it's the whole self. I mean, that's what we're looking for. How do I be in the wholeness of myself? So there's no decolonization that's just gonna affect my race but not affect my gender, not affect my body, because that what we're looking for is the wholeness, um, that place where there is no void um, because we can be centered. And so to me, the decolonization is a centering process um, that will always take us from slavery to freedom. 
um, because we'll begin to shift so many things. Like, you know, I thought I was like, at one point, you know, I'm the smartest feminist going, and then I was in a relationship with a black man, and I realized that I didn't want to hear him speak about his pain. That when we would have conversations, and he would begin to talk, I'd be like, mm, you know. <laughs> and I had that Sylvia cartoon, if you, you know, uh, where that said, the woman is sitting in front of a crystal ball, and Sylvia says, at 2 a.m., men all over the world will begin to talk about their feelings. And you open the card, it's, and it said, and women all over the world will be sorry. <laughs> so I, in critical self-examination, what I saw was that I was asking this black man to be whole, but I really didn't want to hear his pain. Um, I didn't really want to hear what he had gone through. Because sometimes, I mean, it's like reading Kevin Powell's book. I was so stunned by the horribleness of what he had gone through. Um, the rats, the food in the plastic, and the whole thing that it, it made me in a part not want to know about. Like, and I think that that's the challenge that we face in the process of decolonizing and being whole. We got to look at all those parts, and we, it's, it's hard. Your name at the back? Yes. Hi, I'm Suki. Um, I, when you guys were all speaking about your struggle, it's interesting when you would kind of say in terms of people of color, I was thinking about my own individual struggles as a person of color who comes from two different, uh, from African and Caribbean background. My Haitian mother is lighter skin. My Senegalese father is darker skin and how that's, that kind of interracial ethnic identity oppositional context within itself has entirely kind of induced this this moral dilemma that is my life story and struggle and what I hope to eventually work for. And if you could speak a little bit upon the inter-ethnic divides that are obviously a product of the system, but that are galvanized by our community. Yeah. Mark. Well, you know, my whole life until I moved to New, to New York, um, um, almost, almost 10 years ago now, um, people would walk up to me and they would ask me not um, if one of my parents was white, but which one of my parents was white. And both of my parents are black, and all of my grandparents are black, and my great-grandparents are black. And, um, <laughs> and so when I would say, neither, they would be like, get out of here. <laughs> no, you know? And so then I started coming up with this, and this is on both sides. This is, this is cross-race. This is, I mean, every, every, everybody assumed that I was walking around with a white parent. And, um, and, and, and it was really, you know, it, it, was, it was tough because it was a struggle for me. So I, I, I coined this term where I would just look at people and say, plantation genes, you know? <laughs> and that was, that's a good term. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it is a, it, there, there is a struggle there. And I think, again, though, it goes back to that's one of the things where it's like, I, again, I, I know so many people who actually, who's, like yourself, whose who, whose parents are oppositional in, in some respect, and and I didn't have that, you know. I had this sort of sense of self of being a black person, because I knew that both my parents were black, and all my grandparents were black, and my great grandparents were black. I had pictures, you know. I knew, you know, where I came from. So it was a little bit easier for me to kind of go in and say, no, I know, I know who I am. I know, I know who I am. I know where I come from. But it's a, a still a constant. Struggle, and when I moved here, then people just thought I was Dominican. <laughs> well, I think that part of you know, I mean, part of being counter hegemonic, um, and to use Michelle Cliff's phrase, claiming an identity that taught me to sus despise, is we have to li deal with language. So much of our language is binary. Um, you're either this or. Um, and I think that part of the challenge to all of you who are thinkers and creators is that we have to be constantly creating the language that allows us to be who we are. Because that language does not exist in the world of domination. That's, uh, you know, uh, as Audrey and Rich says, this is the oppressor's language, yet I need it to talk with you. How do we change the language that we use in daily life that we use to define ourselves. There was a question over there. Oh, over here, too. I'll come to you next. 
Your name? So, oh, thank you. I'm just asking for a piece of advice. Um, so I happen to be responsible for doing some of this social emotional confidence building work in about 300 girls of color in New York City. And this is more a piece of advice that I would hope to give to them. Um, I really, res you know, it really resonates me all the talk that you guys are talking about, sitting with yourself, saying yes to yourself, having conversations with yourself. Um, but for my young women, oftentimes that's even a difficult point to get to, right? So what are some rituals or tools perhaps that you could give to a young teenage girl on how she can even start that process with herself? Well, one thing is scrapbooking. Like for example, um, I never felt that there was a moment of happiness in my childhood. And so I did do a therapy that required you to gather the pictures and look, you know, or, or my ex, to gather the pictures for him. And he could look at how his face changed the moment sexual abuse uh, by a man came into his life. Um, so that he smiled, but then there's a point at which he never smiles again. So sometimes asking people to just, like, let's bring in the pictures and let's, let's look together and tell me what's going on with you in the pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, what's going on with you uh, when you're three years old? Um, and, uh, you know, that is an easy exercise for people to enter into often. The other thing that I often use in my classes are bring an object that feels very meaningful to you. Like, my um, Aunt Charlie was a hairdresser, and she was one of the first black women that I saw who had her own business, who was creating her money, and she had jars, these green jars that of course were full of all of the, the hair grease. So I, I had one of those jars, and I would frequently bring that jar to say, this is, what is the story that this tells? I find with, with children and with older teenage people, that that really works, the objects that mean something to us, um, you know, that, that shit say a lot about what we feel our needs are in the world. Your name? I wanted, I wanted to add here, if it's OK. To, OK, um, yes, darling. One, there, there is a, I want to shout out um, Amy Mayer of Cox. Raise your hand. Her book is called Shapeshifters, a choreography of black, black, girls. black girls. And one of the things that Amy talks about in her book is the use of movement practices. Um, and a range of other uh, domain, like a, a range of other arts to use, like poetry, poetics, dance. And one, get the book because it's really good. It's specifically addressing black girls in, in the urban space like Detroit. But it also gives wonderful examples about how you can go about doing that work. Well, I went into a movement therapy that was designed by Albert Peso and his partner, who was a choreographer. And one of the things I, I had to challenge myself. This was a group therapy thing that involved being around white people and being with white people. And I didn't really feel like, could I really let myself be vulnerable in a group with white people? And I think that that's a challenge for many of us who want healing but aren't sure that we can be safe in the context that our society has set up for healing. Your name? I'm curious to ask how Audrey practice self-care. Wade, are you the Wade? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for me, you know, self-care comes a lot through interrogation. I was kind of sad that I chose the word interrogating for Friday, but I was thinking that a lot of times um, I do a lot of interviews with myself in my journal to try to get at what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, what I'm hoping. So like I interrogate myself. Like I had a really down feeling about coming to New York this time. The residency seemed difficult. Um, and so I can ask myself, well, well, what would a good trip look like? What would you need um, to feel that there was a reason to come to New York? Um, I had all these friends that were coming and then they all, for various reasons, backed out. Uh, so I was kind of stuck feeling like I'm just by myself in New York. Um, I could just be in Kentucky and be by myself. And then I would ask myself, but what, well, what would be the right experience for you? And then you can ask yourself, well, what steps can I take um, to have that experience? 
uh, who might I turn to? Uh, am I willing to be with a stranger? You know, as I sat next to somebody at my hotel, a white man, we started talking, a white gay man that just moved here from the South. We found we had lots of things in common. I was telling him that because I am a Buddhist writer and thinker, people give me Buddhas. But I was teasing him, and I was like, most of my Buddhas come from Ross Dress for Less. Because, you know, <laughs> um, I, I go in there, and, and the Buddha just says to me, don't leave me here. <laughs> I wasn't meant to spend my life in Ross Dress for Less. <laughs> and he started laughing because it turns out that he has just moved to New York to work for Ross Dress for Less. <laughs> so there, there's, there, I think that synchronicity and, and being able to ask yourself, what is it you need? Because that will clarify for you more and more every day to be able to ask myself. I mean, Wayne Dyer did teach me in his book on intention. So every day when I get up in the morning and I do my prayers and meditation and whatever, I do write down my intentions for the day. Um, because th that is part of manifesting um, and getting clear about what, what would make the day work for you in self-care. I was going to add, I, I like to, you know, this sounds probably simplistic, but the thing that's been giving me so much joy is dancing. Well, why um, is that simplistic? I don't know, but people think, you know, <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> Um, like the pleasure, like the, pl I, I have a very, very busy schedule and sometimes even sleep is like hard to come by. Um, and I have to be honest, I fail a lot at self-care. I really do. I think Wade set that question up on purpose. <laughs> but what the thing that has been bringing me joy, like I went to um, Soul Summit this past weekend and danced with black people who didn't give a shit about police, who they sweated, they banged on drums, they kissed on one another. Everybody was dancing. I sit with my friends on the stoop and we drink wine. You know, like those moments for me are like the, the things. It may not sound like self care, but I tell you what, it is after you're engaging, it is. It, come, it is. I know. But I mean, like, after you have engaged a long day of just like all of these traumas that we're talking about, to be able to sit with people and sip a glass of red or, or dance to some house music. Or, 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 or read a book of poetry, or read a friend's book, a black woman's book that was actually published in a white industry. Like, that shit is what brings me joy. And that's, that's the type of self-care that, that is allowing me to, to, to be sustained every day. One of the things I think that affects us is in, within predominantly white settings, we don't feel we can respond like we might in a, an African-American setting or a other setting. Like, uh, Imani Perry came to my, my institute, and she gave this honorary uh, wonderful talk. She's written about bell hooks. And at the end of it, she's talking about uh, the enchantment and the song they sing, Gloria, because that's, that's my um, n actual given name. And she's talking about the line, I never want to um, see another day without your love. And like two of my black women colleagues just started singing uh, the song. And it was like such a little moment of you know, your love is lifting me higher. But I could see that our white colleagues were kind of like, what, what, what up? <laughs> and you could, you could see us shutting down. Yeah. So I think that that's something that's a challenge to all of us as people of color, as alive uh, and whole white people in the room, is not to shut down that spirit when we're in spaces that are so threatening to us. Uh, I was so moved. Um, and that they, that I didn't even know they could sing, <laughs> you know? But it's like, uh, how much do we spend of our time tamping the, down? Yeah. And even, I mean, I'm a little disturbed, Darnell, that you even question whether the dancing uh, is self-care or is it simplistic rather than hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah that you can dance. Mm. I can't you know, I'll <laughs> oh, stop. Go ahead, Marcy. Yeah, Self care. I, I, I you know, we know what Marcy does. <laughs> <laughs> she gets on her bike <laughs> and, 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 and rides 800 miles. <laughs> I echo. I echo uh, everything Darnell is saying. But I also and and, and recently um, really instilled ritual in my life in the in the morning. And and I have I have I do I've said this before on other panels. But I, I as, as a side hustle I do taxes. Um, <laughs> 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 I 
and I'm really good at it. So, just saying. But, um, <laughs> but, 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 but I, but I, it's extension deadline season, and everybody is like, the phone's ringing off the hook, and everybody's like, I need an appointment at 9 a.m. And I decided that I don't start that work until 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I get up in the morning, I have my ritualistic one cup of espresso that I make on my stovetop with a Bialetti stovetop espresso maker. I sit down, I, w I write, and, and, I, and I do my thing yes. before I give the world, myself to the world. And the other thing that I do that is... Um, I do that too, Marcy. Really, so. that I... That I, that and, and yeah. Stephanie does it. I mean, yeah. no, we just it's have important. to give the affirmation. <laughs> yeah, that it's totally important. And and I also think that you know this there's there's another piece too that I I'm, I'm learning to accept my limitations. So when I say to when someone asks me if I can do something, I'm finally reaching a place in my life where you know what I don't think I can do that for you, but don't stop asking me <laughs> because I can't this time. You know, because I I need to, and that could be, you want to go out, you want to let's let's go out to this show, and I'm tired and I'm at home, and I might want to go to the show, but I also know my body needs to rest. So you know, I'm like, you know what? I haven't seen you in a, in, a, in a few few weeks or a month, but let's can we do it another time? Because I need to rest. And I think I think we often think that if we don't do all the things that our friends and our loved ones want us to do, then somehow they're not going to be here there for us down the road, and I just don't think that's true, you know, so I think that's part of it. Your name? Hi, Mary. I'm Dahlia. Hi again. Um, my question to you is, how do we revive an imagination that has been deadened? Because it didn't occur to me that I'd been experiencing that until you spoke on it. So that's my question to you all. Well, I think, you know, Pima Chodron, as Buddhist teacher, always um, challenges us to begin where you are. So if you feel that something is deadened inside you, you have to kind of think about, you know, Sweet Honey in the Rock, rock seeing the song that if you're lost, um, go back to the place where you last felt um, that you were at home, that you were safe. I think the same works for the imagination. Return to whatever, you, a children's book, uh, a word uh, that might just Create a spark. Think about like think. Imagine that you're making a fire, and what do you put on? What what kindling do you find? Because um, there's always something in our life that delights us, even if it's bad toxic food, you know, <laughs> like uh, kettle corn. Uh, <laughs> to 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 seek the imagination in the place of delight, because I think that's where it is most easily found. Another question? Your name? Thanks. Um, in talking about this transition from pain to power, I guess I was wondering if once you've achieved power and self-awareness, if there are any benefits to um, keep like bearing in mind the pain that you've once endured. You have to put the pain in perspective, and that um, the power become power that you're the agency is that you can put the pain in perspective. You know, I I chant in the morning, um, and a lot of times I chant uh, that I let the past go, um, because I think that one has to let it go, even as it's a, a, a kind of cognitive dissonance. You need to remember at the same time that you let go its hold on you. And I think that's, that's a thing about the voice of judgment, too. How do we remember what was said but not be allowing it to twist and grind us? Um, so, because, you know, those of you who are in therapy and stuff know that we get triggered um, by situations, by people, by images. And you have to be self-aware to know, gee, what, what happened that I, I woke up and I felt good, but I'm feeling like, I'm in the abyss. I, I need to kill myself. Um, what happened there? Or if you're acting out, to think, what's motivating this acting out um, that I'm doing? Another question? Yes. Your name? My name is Tony Rockley. I was diagnosed with anxiety and attendance school. 
My question is about this mapping desire. Thanks. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> about this mapping desire and how we can go beyond these mainstream images which has been imposing you know, to us 24 hours from social network websites, from you know, everywhere, you know, putting aside academia because we are all intellectuals here. When it comes to our everyday urban life, you know, uh, the way the mainstream media or the system based in violent capital accumulation shaping the desire is something uh, very relevant to this talk, I guess. And another thing yes. is about this sex, I mean, sex practice even, you know. What does sex mean? Because everyone talks to sex, you know. That's tomorrow uh, this, night, this baby. Moment <laughs> of I'm talking about this moment of pre-orgasm and post-orgasm, you know, the moment, because we, we, ca we can talk, you know, endlessly talk about love or whatever we want. And the next question is about ideology and <laughs> imagination. Ideology and imagination to uh, avoid this uh, spiritual Buddhism and things, which is very, it's a very fashionable brands in the global north. How one can define this relation between ideology and imagination to go and to move further? I mean. Well, you, kn you know the brother's asking all these deep and profound questions <laughs> that can't be answered. But <laughs> I think that what's it. great about those questions is that they stimulate us to go beyond this room and to be thinking and talking about those things. Because I, I, I sometimes as speakers, I hate the question and answer period because you don't have the time to, to work through um, like those kinds of very deep questions. <laughs> Um, but we are going to talk about sex t tomorrow night. <laughs> um, is there another question brewing out there? No questions? Wow. Uh, that's good self-care. That must mean <laughs> this is our stopping point. Want no last question? OK, I see your hand. Hi, my name is Angela. Um, I'm so happy to be here in, in your presence. So um, I have a question. Um, my favorite book by you is Art on My Mind. And um, it really stimulates me as a black woman to look at art. But I don't always see um, black individuals going out to critique art out there. I don't really see them for the public's viewing in the, like in a popular setting. And I wanted to um, also talk about I feel as if, as a black woman, I'm Ghanaian. Every time I learn about my culture, I have to confront loss, because I have to remember right. what we have lost. Yes. And so how would you um, give me advice to finding c the community to also meet other people and talk about art and also confronting the loss that you know I always learn about my culture, if that makes any sense? Well, I think part of it is to, again, take that loss and create art and from that loss. What, when you think of what that loss is, what does it look like? Um, and then you can either post notices where people can join you who are interested in using that creativity in that way. Um, my sister went to Ghana, and it was very transformative. And she's been trying to raise uh, money for um, a church to have a roof. But what she did was get all these people together to make art. Um, using some thought, some dream, some image that they had of Ghana. And they've raised all this money, and it's been really incredible um, to realize, again, the power of representation, uh, the power of an image. I mean, I have, I bought at the, at the art fair an image of a little black Ghanaian girl, but she has such a, a, a sense of brightness and hope about her, and I have that image it's the first thing I see when I wake up in the morning. So that let's talk about how images and the world of what we look at can be restorative, can be absolutely healing. I, I have all the Buddhas in my house, but I also have the black wooden Jesus. And then I have the red and green and yellow Judas. Um, and <laughs> Stephanie knows my house is full of art objects um, because of the way that art can heal and lift us up. I want to thank the New School, Stephanie, um, all the people that make it possible, our videographer people, um, Dan and Emily, 
um, Jen, um, the people who make this possible. Uh, thank you all, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Bill. I just want Marcy to know that I ride bicycles in my <laughs> dreams. That's a start. <laughs>